The title of this talk is maybe slightly different than it was in the original abstract. Basically what happened is we realized we gave a very similar talk last year, so we decided to pump it up a little bit, give it a little bit more uh, technical and operational depth, and we'll see how it goes. Um, anyway, I'm glad to be here. I'm a uh, senior software engineer at Google and a committer on Apache Beam. I've been working on the Beam project and its predecessors at Google for the past uh, year and a half, roughly. Beam is uh, incubating in Apache, although we're currently undergoing graduation vote basically right now. So I hope that in a month or so that, that will change. So if you don't remember anything else from this talk, I think it's important that you take away that Apache Beam is three things. It's a unified programming model designed to provide efficient and portable data processing pipelines. So that's kind of a mouthful. It's a tagline. But what does that mean in practice? Well, so we have the Beam programming model, which is what a lot of sort of past talks have been about. Uh, if you came to our tutorial yesterday, for instance, you saw a pretty in-depth description of these four questions, what, where, when, and how, which is basically addressing what we're computing, aka classic big data processing, plus a bunch of stuff designed to support streaming and temporal data, such as where in event time do we care about what we're computing, when do we want the output, and how do we want to handle sort of multiple outputs, inspective outputs, and that kind of thing. But of course, the model is really just a concept. It's just a spec. In some sense, it's just a mathematical object. And so we also need to be able to use these things. So we have SDKs that make the model concrete and let you write programs in it. Currently, we have Java and Python, although there are other languages people are interested in running. And then we have a bunch of runners that can take programs written using this model in these SDKs and execute them on different data processing backends. So right, Beam is intended to be a model that is independent of which system you want to run, whether it's Apache Apex, Apache Flink, Apache Spark, Google Cloud Dataflow. We also have an Apache Gear Pump runner coming. People are talking about Storm. So you know, the idea is you write a pipeline, you can run it on any of these runners. And so this is a pretty grand vision. And on top of that, in addition to being sort of unified and portable, we also want it to be efficient. So to quickly start out, let's talk a little bit about the model. So for many of you who are familiar with MapReduce, a lot of this will be pretty familiar. So we have some data type that defines a distributed collection of data. So we call those P collections, right? It's a parallel, possibly distributed collection. And one of the things the B model brings in is time. So sort of by default, all elements have timestamps and they're in some temporal window. Of course, if you don't care about time, we just make these reasonable defaults like the beginning of time and the window being all of time. But in practice, for most of the most interesting Beam use cases, you'll really care about uh, time and windowing because you need this to do anything in the streaming sense. Now, of course, we, how do you get P collections? Well, you have a source, which is some description of where you'll get data, such as a Kafka cluster and the name of a Kafka topic. And you have readers that can take these sources and produce data from them. And readers do two things here. One is they produce these P collections of elements. They're time stamped. And in the sort of unbounded case, they're also mostly in order. And so to go with these elements that are mostly in order, you provide a watermark, which essentially quantifies what mostly in order means. It quantifies basically how out of order the data can be. The talk after this one from Slava will go into that a lot more. Now again, if you're familiar with MapReduce, we have an operation called pardu, which is parallel do to the elements of these parallel collections. It's basically a flat map. And we have group by key and co-group by key, which do what you expect. We also have a notion of side inputs, which you can use for either distributed joins or broadcast joins, things like that. But then the last two primitives are really interesting. So we have an operation called windowing, which takes these elements that are time stamped and in some window, and it re-windows them. So you can assign an element to zero or more windows, potentially dropping it. Um, and you can make these data dependent. So you have you know, fixed windows, sliding windows, in uh, other terms, hopping windows and tumbling windows. Um, and but you also have data dependent windows. So things like session windows, where you sort of identify what the temporal windows are based on what the actual content of the stream is. And then you have triggers that are important in streaming systems to sort of say when you can output data. Typically, this is some combination of what window an element is in, what relation the watermark has to that window. So if you believe all your data for the window has been produced already, it's time to produce results often. Maybe how many elements have been in the window, how late the data is, things like that. Again, if you want to hear more about this, the talk immediately after this one will go into this in detail. Honestly, I'm not going to talk much more about the intricacies of the model than that, except to say that with these six primitives, you can implement really a very powerful host of operations. So really, everything from classic batch to standard batch jobs where timing matters, you're doing you know, daily windows or hourly windows or monthly windows, 
streaming systems that give you exactly once and sort of event time aware and let you do things more powerful like produce early results to make sure you can react in real time to things that are happening, handle late data, and even support user-defined sessions. All of this is really crucial. So for instance, sessions in particular are extremely important. If you look at how these systems are used internally at Google, essentially most use cases would not be enabled at all if you couldn't do sessions. So again, there are lots of great talks where you can learn more about the model, and some of this will be covered in Slava's talk. I want to motivate to you Beam by talking through a very simple clickstream analysis pipeline. So imagine I have a data stream that is essentially user activity on my site. So for instance here, I have a logged in user. I can see what page they clicked on. I can see what timestamp that click happened. And maybe a bunch of more analytics data, but those three fields are all I care about for now. In this very simple application, what I want to get out of this is for each user in my system, how long their session was, AKA you know, what, what time window they were active on my site, and also what their activity level was. Here I'm just going to make that the number of pages they viewed during that session length. Of course, as the pipeline author, I have other goals. So if this is live data, you know, my, I'm running some campaign, maybe I just showed an ad on TV, who knows what, um, I want to be able to track ongoing sessions as they're happening. So if a user's going to be clicking around on my site for four hours, I want to know this is happening you know, well before that whole time, window of time has ended, and certainly before tomorrow. So I'm going to use a streaming system, and I'm going to want to be able to get speculative output. For instance, the session, as you can see in the middle, goes till 3.30, but uh, you know, maybe at 3.15 we want to find out that this is early. You know, an early result of this user is active with some activity level. On the flip side, if this is you know, not streaming data, this is not live, I'm running over last week's or last month or yesterday's data, I don't really want this same semantics, right? I want this to be, I want to get my results much faster. I want to use potentially more resources. I want to read the data out of order if I don't care about sort of the uh, really getting results as soon as I can. Um, but I still, of course, want correct output. So this is the entire program. Three stanzas plus running the pipeline with maybe a little bit of setup I, I skipped at the top. I'll go through each of these three stanzas in, in sort of a little bit of detail. So at the beginning of pipelines, we have sources. Pipelines can have multiple sources, of course, but the code basically, the schema of the code looks like this. I have a read transform, which is shown here in green, and I have some sort of parse transform. So in this simple line of code, you have a lot of power. So imagine if what you're reading from is an Apache Kafka topic, or say an active MQ stream, or maybe a file system that you're tailing and waiting for new files to show up. This is a live, roughly an order stream of messages, and we don't know when it ends. This is an unbounded P collection. And sample green code here for Kafka might be, you know, go read this Kafka topic. There's probably some more configuration around what cluster I'm going to read from. On the other hand, if I've got these messages archived, maybe, you know, I'm reading Kafka's offset ranges from yesterday. Maybe I have files in a distributed file system like HTFS. Well, now this is archival data. I can read it in any order, and this is, ne this is sort of necessarily bounded. I've decided I want to read yesterday's data. This is a finite period of time. And it might look like that. And just by changing this, the semantics of those read transforms, now I have, in sort of almost no code, made this completely unified between bounded and unbounded. Additionally, I've made this, by combining this with some parser that is sort of specific to my source, right, maybe I get strings out of a text file versus some kind of Avro encoded struct out of Kafka. Maybe I, I can actually combine these and use the same Avro structs. With a little bit of parser, now I have a unified sort of two transform block of code that is able to read from any source in an unbounded or bounded way and prep this data for processing. Now the next step here is to think about windowing data. So if you look at the graph below, I have on the x-axis the time that events actually happen, and these orange dots are little user activities, so you know, clicking around. And if you know, we talk about sessions, in orange the code above says window into sessions with a three minute gap. So what that means is if I look at this stream of events, any continuous stream where there's no period of three minutes where nothing's happening is going to be considered the same session. And visually, we can all look at this and go, okay, there's one session here. It starts at 304 and it ends at 325. However, in the, again, in streaming systems, data does not arrive in order like this. It's not perfect. So what will happen instead looks something like this. There's event time, but also it's important to take into account processing time. So this dashed line is the y equals x line, where you know events come in exactly come into our system for processing at exactly the time that they occur. This is the ideal case, but of course this can happen. In this schematic example for visual effect, events are a few minutes delayed. Hopefully in practice it's much less than that. 
But you see a couple different things here. The first thing is you see the events have some delay. And of course, those delays are variable. So in this hypothetical scenario, you know, maybe I was in my hotel a few blocks away. I walked outside. I got on 3G. I came into the conference hotel and jumped on the conference Wi-Fi. And you're going to see different delays between each of the events. And maybe there was some period of time where I walked through a tunnel where my events didn't get delivered at all or only showed up a few minutes later when some internal system retried. These are the kinds of real effects that happen in your data if you're trying to deal with real systems. Lots of other ways this can manifest, like users turning airplane mode off. So this purple code here talks a little bit about how I want to deal with these sessions. I want to get early estimates of what's happening. So after we window into sessions with three minute gap durations, we say, OK, I want to produce output at the watermark, AKA when I believe I've received all the data for this window. But also, I want some early firings. And to give you a sense of what that means, let's say I have an early firing at, uh, I guess, in green. This is sometime after 3.10 on the y-axis. I have an early firing that says, OK, with the part of the data I've seen before, the part of the data below the line, I think there's one session. But this is still a speculative result. As I wait a little bit longer, if you look at all the orange dots below the line, now I say, OK, from here, so far, it looks like there's two sessions. There's a big gap in the middle, but I have two sessions going on. And only after I've seen all the data can I finally realize this is one session uh, that covers this whole thing because that late data came in. And if, you don't, if you're not able to take into account event time and processing time in your system and handle out of order and late data, you're not able to reconstruct true results like this. Of course, none of this is possible without some watermark, giving you some sense of how late your data is. I won't go into much more detail than that, but watermarks are super exciting and stay for the next talk. Now, I'm basically going to skip writing. Writing is essentially the duel of reading. So I can write to lots and lots of different syncs. I have some formatter, and then I write them out. So imagine this is your pipeline, right? This is sort of the thing you're running in your business. Uh, and I think everyone who has run a pipeline like this has had two conflicting goals in mind. So again, I have my live streaming job. I'm trying to analyze my Kafka stream in real time. Hypothetically, on average, I need 10 workers to sort of handle my stream. I get a pipeline lag of a few seconds. If I have a couple million users over a day, some of whom come back for repeat sessions, and I'm getting speculative results so my analysts can take action on this, maybe I'm producing you know, 4.7 sessions total among early and final results. Because I use 10 workers over the course of the day, that use 240 worker hours. Now, I have a batch job. I'm analyzing the same data, but you know, stored on HDFS, because it's yesterday's logs. In this case, I don't really care about those speculative results. I'm going to spin up, I'm making this up, 200 workers, and run it for 30 minutes. I get the same input, I get the same output, except I don't have any of those speculative results. And because I'm able to do this so much more efficiently, I use roughly half the number of workers, right? Only, say, 100 worker hours. So I think everybody has wanted to do this who's running streaming pipelines. The question is, what do your users have to do? So I've talked to some users who say, oh, you know, this is simple. It's standard Lambda architecture. You have your streaming system. You do some stuff there. You have your archive system. And you know, I've written one program in Storm that does the left job. And I've written a completely different program in MapReduce or Spark or your favorite batch execution system to do the right job. In Beam, however, we don't want you to have to live this way. We want you to write you know, roughly five, 10 lines of code that switch from, say, text files to Kafka and maybe change some command line arguments. We even have users that are um, running the streaming jobs in Flink because they think Flink is the best streaming runner that they want to run, and the batch jobs in Spark because they prefer the way that their you know, Spark integrates with Yarn or something like that. Uh, and you can get all this with the same code by just changing command line arguments. So that gives you a very brief overview of what I mean by unified program model. Let's talk a bit about why Beam enables runners to be efficient. I've hinted at this a little bit, but let's get into more, some more detail. So the first thing is the Beam model, the APIs we've designed around things like sources and syncs and transforms, are really designed to empower runners to make smart decisions that are runner specific. So let's talk about reading from a source. Let's say I have some archive of files on HDFS and I want to analyze it. In most sort of open source data processing systems, what you would do for this is you would say, I'm going to configure some number of mappers, maybe 1,000. Right? The user is making a choice. Based on this data set and this pipeline, I want you to split this 1,000 ways. And it's kind of a black art how you pick that number 1,000. Maybe you take one of the th million files you're analyzing, run it on a two-node cluster, and then go, OK, I'm going to you know, put 1,000 nodes in this cluster, but I've got a million more files based on this runtime and that scaling is to wait for this long. So I'm going to choose that many shards. 
What we'd really want is for the user to just say, hey, go read from this source. So how this works in Beam is that sources, which are metadata about some source of data, so like it's a file name, maybe an offset range, they have uh, one function that tells you how big they are, another function that the runner can call that says, please split into chunks of roughly this size. The key thing here, however, is that the runner is making these choices, not the user. So imagine the user says, hey, go read from my logs. The, source can, the runner can say to the source, hey, how big is that? And it goes and you know, stats the files, does a bulk stat, who knows what, and says, oh, this is 50 terabytes of data. Now the runner can look at the user's credentials and they can look at other things, like cluster utilization, the quota on my system or per user, the amount of bandwidth that's available on the network, if there's any resource reservations now or pending, which is the bottleneck step in this job that's gonna slow everything down and, and sort of scale to that one, how much throughput are we, are we gonna be able to produce of different pieces of code? And based on that, it can make an intelligent decision. In this case, why don't you split into one terabyte chunks? Now the source will send back metadata saying, okay, I had those million files, here's one terabyte worth. Maybe it's a grouping of 5,000 of them. Maybe it's one really big file, but I give you the beginning and you the middle and you the end. So now I have all these different chunks, and the runner can go execute these chunks in parallel. So this is very similar to what you'd be doing in MapReduce or similar systems, except that the runners are making the choices here instead of the users, and we're gonna come back to that later. Another thing that runners get to control is bundling. So a bundle is a group of elements that are processed and then committed together. So if you think about a mapper in MapReduce, you might do some setup work, process the element or n elements, and then finish. And this is sort of one transaction. In a streaming runner, these transactions are very small, right? I'm trying to push tuples through from end to end as quickly as I can, so I'm gonna have relatively small bundles, which enables me to have low latency pipelining between different stages in the job, but it also has some overhead because I'm making frequent transactions or frequent checkpoints, or it has some fault tolerance cost because if I have to fail and restart from an earlier checkpoint, I have to roll back many transactions or many bundles. In a classic batch job, right, you have very large bundles. Each map task is essentially, you know, a huge amount of work with you're only starting and finishing a couple times. You have fewer large commits. It's generally more efficient because there's less overhead, but you also have these long synchronous stages, and if one of these stages fails, you have to restart and sort of redo all of that work. And other runners can make different trade-offs, but the key is that the users are not really aware of these bundles, uh, except in, insofar as making their code sort of correct. Uh, but the runner gets to choose how big these bundles are, and by doing that, they can be efficient, streaming low latency based on the use case they're trying to provide. One third example of this is the triggering. So I talked about how triggers say when output is produced, maybe say speculatively every minute, but really these things are flow control, not instructions. It really is, hey, it's okay to produce data, not you have to produce data now. What that means is runners are free to ignore a trigger in some, in some cases. So if your streaming pipeline gets pretty bogged down and the triggering itself actually is making you fall farther and farther behind for these speculative results that are sort of best effort, runners can decide to drop them in order to catch up. The batch runner, as I alluded to in the uh, sort of, uh, in that one slide earlier that was comparing the overhead and running streaming versus batch, can just drop all these advisory triggers completely because it's much more efficient to just run the job to completion, which is what the user actually wants when they're running in batch but the code doesn't have to change. The other thing that happens here that's very common in both streaming and batch systems is that your pipeline workload varies a lot, and this really affects your efficiency. So in a streaming job, right, you have you know, user activity patterns that could be based on events that are happening, that could be based on diurnal usage, but your input is gonna vary, and as such, the amount of resources you need to process your job is gonna change. And batch pipelines go through stages. Maybe my early stages are reading data out of files or out of streams that's you know, I.O. bound, and my next stage is running some machine learning model, which is compute bound. And the stage after that, I'm just formatting things for some output system, which is now based on, you know, the number of nodes I have that store my data. And so I don't want, I don't really, for either of these cases, I don't really want to pick one fixed resource limit. So, you know, in the streaming example, if I pick the, if I dedicate the number of workers to this job based on what I think my peak load is, well, I'm wasting a lot of resources when the pipeline is much uh, less loaded. If I go for the average case, I still have some periods of uh, idle resources and some periods I'm actually not keeping up. So really making one decision is not gonna work in these cases. Ideally, you wanna have some way of adapting as you go. And the same thing applies in batch. You know, imagine, so in this graph I have time in the x-axis and different tasks on the y-axis, different map tasks, say. 
and the length of the bar is just how long each task takes. Of course, we, we jump through hoops to try to make these tasks equal by, say, giving you equal amounts of files or equal Kafka offset ranges or things like that. But fundamentally, this is going to be uneven. And the reason could be things like data-dependent processing that varies. It could be things like runtime effects where one worker is slow. It could be lots of other effects. And if you've got a multi-stage batch processing pipeline, these effects are cumulative, right? This stage cannot, the next stage can't start until all tests in the previous stage finish. And so if you look at this, all the black time in that sort of bar graph is essentially idle resources. So there are lots of standard workarounds here. I'm sure you're familiar with many of them. You know, Go out of, maybe one might be go out of the way to make the input evenly distributed. So splitting files in equal size, maybe even sampling. Maybe you just over split a whole bunch. Because you know that even though tasks will take different amounts, if, you have, if they're all really small, you can still bin pack them in a way that looks roughly even. But now you get a bunch of overhead. The point is that all of these solutions are actually pretty costly. So for instance, by over splitting a lot, you have a lot of extra overhead. And none of them is a complete solution, right? They're all still kind of hacks. So in Beam, we have this mantra that really no amount of upfront heuristic tuning you do is going to be good enough. There's always something unpredictable at runtime, and you need to have ways of adapting. From the API level, here's one example of something that's really powerful. Runners or readers, which are you know, taking some metadata about a source, like read this part of Kafka, can actually provide you progress signals saying how much work they're getting done. So for instance, in a bounded source, you say, what fraction of my data have I consumed? In an unbounded source, you say, what's my backlog, right? Am I keeping up with my input or not? And based on these signals, the runner can choose to make decisions about what to do. In the streaming case, you might uh, upscale. Say, if you have a large backlog or backlog that's growing, you might upscale, sending some of the key ranges to different workers to work on. And in the bounded case, which is the one that's easier to demonstrate, you do things like, hey, I noticed that task is taking a long time. Let's take the end of that work and give it to someone else to do. And of course, just to make sure you don't uh, do this too much or upscale or use your entire cluster thinking you have parallelism that doesn't exist, sources can also tell you when they can't be split. So a schematic diagram of this looks like, looks like this. We have that same graph where time's on the x-axis and different tasks are on the y-axis. All the green tasks are completed. All the yellow tasks are in progress. And based on the, the sort of time they've been processing plus their estimated completion, we're, we are estimating that the beige work is the work, amount of work remaining. And we can see visually by looking at this that we have some stragglers. So that average bar is if we took all the work in those beige bars and distributed it completely evenly, we'd finish exactly at that purple bar, the average bar. But of course we see that it's not even. So what are we gonna do about this? Well, we can pick that average and invoke the dynamic splitting API. Say, please split off the tail of your work. Give that back to me as a new test that I can give to someone else. So you see that happening there. And of course, we can iterate this. So we, we split off those two tests. We generate two new tests and give them to the workers that are available for extra work. And then sometime later, we find out, well, our estimates weren't perfect, right? The fraction is not moving exactly as I expected because sources are not uniform. But I, again, can figure out, hey, I have a straggler. I have an idle worker. Let's split some work off. Let's rebalance it. And this is an example of a real pipeline running on the, on the cloud data flow runner. We have a two-stage batch pipeline, reading from some files, shuffling the data, processing the shuffle data, and writing it out. And we are executing this in batch mode, so the, the read and shuffle has to start before the read from shuffle and write out. And we've turned off the dynamic adaptation. But we still do jump through a bunch of hoops to make sure the data is split evenly. What you see, however, is that there's a lot of white, right? So the first stage can't complete until you know, this one sort of long task right here in the middle completes. And so you have all this white here is workers that finished early and don't have work they can do. And the same thing happens in the second phase of the job. When we turn on these dynamic rebalancing APIs, we end up with this much nicer graph. So you see we have this early region where all the tasks are running evenly. This, this bit of white here is when workers have finished their tasks and are waiting for the next ones to come out. Things get split off. And what you see is there are some bands of white. There's still some white in here, but there's a lot less than there used to be. The shuffle is even better well balanced in general because reading from files has a lot of overhead and reading from shuffle can often be very uniform as long as the sort of amount of data per key is also somewhat balanced. The important thing though is that all of this area over here is savings. The job finishes earlier, you can give those resources back. The person running the pipeline has to wait a lot less for their results. 
So everyone is happy, you're, you're, you know, you're spending less money on your jobs, you're getting your results faster, and this is, this is a much better scenario for everybody. On top of this, these APIs play well with the other thing you might want to do, which is auto-scale your system. So let's say I have a job that is doing some single stage task, and based on the amount of data there was, but also based on how much work I think the job is doing per data, I initially allocate only 80 workers based on size. And I only split roughly into 80 tasks, maybe a little bit more for some slot based on size. Well, after a little while we decide, hey, we think this job needs more workers. So let's go ahead and split the work up, make new tasks, and then spin up new workers to do that. So that's what's happening here. We have these vertical bars of blue, which are somewhat hard to see, I know, sorry about that. Um, and each one of those is when the system is decided to upsize, but, and it needs more tasks in order to, when it spins up new workers, have work to give them. That's what's happening in those blue bars. Then we go and launch new workers, which takes a few minutes to come up, then they all come up, and then we decide, hey, we should upsize again. So we have five or so rounds of, of upsizing in this graph, but what you see is, this job has smoothly upscaled from what we initially thought we could do with only 80 workers to 1,000 workers. All of the work stayed balanced, right? All of the workers were active pretty much the entire time they were up. We did not have to oversplit initially. So we didn't have to produce you know, tens of thousands of tasks for our only 80 machines, which would have been a lot of extra overhead, a lot of opening files and seeking to the middle of them or things like that. Um, so we really had a pretty optimal uh, execution of this job. The other thing that's really nice here is that by combining these two things, we also have these long-running tasks, a couple of task failures introduced. Maybe the, you know, the file system we're reading from had a timeout. And so this is some task that ran for you know, two-thirds the length of the job, and eventually it failed and we had to restart it because we haven't committed anything yet. It's a very long task. But because we had dynamic work rebalancing, we don't have to rerun that whole task as one unit. We can restart it on some worker and then immediately recognize it's a straggler and start assigning the tail of that work away. So we were able to sort of take these long-running tasks and abort them and still not have stragglers in our execution. So that was a, a dip into how Beam enables runners to be efficient. I showed, the results I showed were running on the Google Cloud Dataflow runner, but actually other runners support them, the direct runner supports them now, and we're trying to figure out how to integrate them into the other Beam runners as well. So quickly talking about portability, I showed you this sample pipeline, and one of the points I made is that if you look at this code, there's nothing here that says, hey, this is specialized for Spark, or this is specialized for Apex. Um, all this code is runner independent. But to really prove that it's portable, since I have a little bit of time, I thought I'd show you a very quick demo. So, of course, I'm here at Strata. This is a big data conference. Um, everyone knows what the classic big data demo should be. It is word count. So, the, uh, this will look very similar to what you've seen on the slide. This is the main program here. We have some options we've set up. We're gonna parse them from the command line. We are going to create a pipeline. Then we're going to, this of course is a very sort of verbose, well-commented example for educational purposes. So we're going to read from a file, and that produces one string, which is one string per line of a file. We're gonna apply this count words transform, which has a whole, it has sort of the word count logic embedded in it. And so it takes lines of a file and produces key value pairs where we have word, comma, count. We are going to use a map function to convert those key value pairs into strings we can print, and we're gonna write them to our output. We're gonna run this pipeline and wait till it finishes, and here we have a nice roughly 10 line program that is able to run word count on any input text file to any output file in parallel, distributed, so on and so forth, on any runner. Before I jump over to the demo itself, just real quick to jump into sort of this composite transform count words, that should be up here somewhere. So, these composite transforms are something that, that uh, were new to Flume Java at Google, one of the, or Flume at Google, which is one of the systems that sort of inspired uh, or led to Beam. So we had this P transform, right? So everything's P. We have, it takes as input a P collection of strings, so a list of lines, a collection of lines, and it produces as output a P collection of string long, right? Word, comma, count, pairs. And you can see what this does. It's actually very simple. So we, uh, we have an extractor function, which I'll show you, and then we uh, run the count per element transform. So this thing here is another function that takes in a line and produces all the words in that line, and then down here we'll just apply our count transform. So the extractor function is a little bit long, but only because sort of educational value plus some interesting stuff with aggregators. So 
the core logic is here. Uh, we, in our context, we go get our element out. This is our line. We drop white space on it. If it's empty, we just increment a counter, saying, hey, we found an empty line. This is useful for sort of monitoring, right? I don't want to see all the lines. I don't want to log the lines, because logging is very expensive. But I have some counter I can look at my monitoring dashboard. And if that counter starts going crazy, then I can say, hmm, I think my input has gone bad, or my logic is screwed up somewhere. Standard Java regex stuff, split my line into things that are continuous chunks of white space and then output all the non-empty words. So this is our flat map, right, that produces these counters. So I've showed you word count code in, in, in simple. I have over here my, uh, okay, reset the output. So I have here, I've generated an, uh, the archetype. I've used our sort of example archetype using the nightly build of Beam uh, that generates this word count example for us. Uh, it has that same code over here in the source this is that same code we were just looking at. And let's start by running it on the direct runner. So this is the direct runner. And so let's look at this code just a little bit. So we're going to use Maven. We're going to compile the code and then execute it because Maven exec doesn't pick up things that aren't installed. Uh, so this is a, a way of sort of hacking around that to get the code in our class path. We're going to run the word count program. And then these command line arguments are the pipeline options that we parse. So I'm actually going to read the palm for this example. I'm going to output to a directory called direct with a, with a prefix called counts. Then I turn on the direct runner profile, which says make the direct runner available for this job. So I run this, and it should not use the network, which would be good. Uh, it's compiling the code now, and it is starting up. So this, that was the direct runner output right here. It says, hey, you know, I found one file for the palm glob. It started up a thing. It created some files, and we can go look at the output here. It's in the direct runner folder. And now we have, we've taken our counts prefix and appended to it 0 of 1, 0 of 2, 0 of 3, uh, or 0 of 4, 1 of 4, 2 of 4, 3 of 4. Uh, so you know, we're teaching users with word count. We could produce only one file. But in distributed systems, in practice, you will never get that. So we're teaching users that the output is, is distributed. And if we look at one of these things, um, we will see you know, a bunch of words, right? Word, comma, count, pairs. And if I were to sort of look at all of them and sort, you'll see, oh, hey, I had 67 instances of the word version. I have, you know, two transformer, 20 thes, et cetera. So I have my word count output. But, okay, the direct runner, it's our testing runner. It's very simple. That's not super exciting. So we just added in the project a few weeks ago uh, Apache Apex, which is another streaming runner. So it, again, is designed very small bundles, producing tuples as quickly as possible. We are currently here running Apex in a loop. So as I started that Maven command, we, we brought up a local Apex instance. At the end of it, we shut it down. If you're familiar with Apex, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening here that I can't tell you all that much about. Um, but these are, there's some standard beam output, plus down here some standard Apex output, including you know, stopping the server. And if we go look at the Apex output, here we will see there are actually 260 files produced. So this is because Apex is doing very small bundles, and it's producing one file per bundle. So the direct runner is able to you know, combine many, many words into a single file. The Apex runner here is, if I look at the Apex output, I believe each file, uh, Apex slash, pick a random number. The Apex file has one word per file. And so that's just an artifact of how the Apex runner itself works. It chooses how it executes. But of course, if I were to cat Apex slash star and sort it, you'll see similar things, 67 versions, hopefully the same thing. Two transformer, 18 scopes. Right? And I can do this again. So I can come over here. I can run it on Flink in embedded mode. The only thing I've changed here is if I scroll up a little bit. The only thing I've changed here are these command line arguments. So same input. The output now is flink slash counts. And the name of here, I've said flink runner. And I turn on the flink runner profile, which just puts the right jars on the class path. Um, now we have flink specific output. Oh, I had some map partition running, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I can look at the flink output. And here I got a single file. And it's all the words are sorted. So the flink runner in batch mode has done something different. But that's fine. Still, we have 67 versions. I can, of course, yep, do this on Flink in cluster mode. 
So, you know, I know these examples where I'm like spinning up Flink locally and then turning Flink off looks kind of hacky. So here, the main difference is we're using packaging instead of just compiling and using the class jars on my class path. We're taking the bundled jar that we produce in our package phase and sending it off to the Flink cluster. The Flink cluster, of course, is a one node cluster running on a machine, but it's the same execution as it would be if I were submitting to a real Flink cluster out in the cloud. Based on my experiences with the Wi-Fi here at this conference, I chose to do it locally. Um, and you see the same sort of output here. I used the same output directory, so that's not convincing. But you can go over to the Flink web dashboard now, and you can see, OK, I've run a bunch of jobs. This one here, I just ran. It completed at uh, 220, so that's basically right now. And you can see how we've mapped that Beam program into a Flink operator graph. You know, Whatever sort of metrics you're excited about will show up there. I'll stop there before going any further. I could show you the same demo on Spark and the same demo on Cloud Dataflow. Um, the cloud demos are harder here where the Wi-Fi is not working very well because network RPCs can fail pretty often. So it was a bad experience yesterday's tutorial, so I'll just skip it. But the, you know, here is the same graph running on Spark that I ran earlier today. This is Spark's version of this web UI. If you look at this, there are some interesting things here. So every runner, of course, is also choosing how it maps the Beam concepts down into their specific view. So we see things like, is it this one? Maybe it's the next one. We see things like, if I look at the details for these things, I can see exactly which pieces of code they're executing. And here I even see things like readline slash readlines.out. So this is mapping my Beam program itself back into the Spark uh, model, where actually the names of the RDDs correspond to the names of P collections in my Beam program. This is a similar display for Cloud Dataflow. It uses your web browser. It shows you, you know, the same sort of four steps we saw in the program, which you can expand and see. You know, here's extracting the words, and here's the count. Um, over here, you see the empty line count for the files, things like that. I'll stop there. Go back to the presentation. <clears throat> so that wraps up my talk. Uh, you know, I showed you a Beam pipeline. We talked through a little bit about how it works how it handles lots of different input sources and different outputs, how it's portable across runners. I showed you a demo. I talked about efficiency. What I would like you folks to do is get involved with Beam. So right now, you know, we're a project that's incubating in the Apache system. We have, over the course of the last 10 months now, you know, gone from being some Google-specific thing to being something that really is portable across five different runners. Uh, we are trying to get out of incubation, so we have a graduation vote happening right now. But in general, you know, if you analyze data, if you are you know, responsible for running applications for your company's insights team, right, you don't want to write your pipelines over and over and over again when you're trying out different runners. So if you write your pipeline once, we can run it everywhere. If you have some data storage system or messaging system, some API you build, we need connectors. So I showed you in the very simple sort of file reading example how dynamic work rebalancing adds a lot of power and dy dynamicity to execution. So for every one system you have, we can, of course, use a bunch of the existing connectors for these codes. But if you look at, for instance, the Hadoop input format API, it doesn't have any dynamic ad adaptation to it. It just has initial splitting. So yeah, you can do a good job of splitting up front, but then later at runtime, you want to be able to dynamically rebalance. So we found, for instance, that writing our dedicated Avro connectors have given us much better performance than using some of the existing ones. And of course, if you have some other system you're interested in, you know, a new programming language, a new API, you want to write a new DSL or some new library, do something like machine learning or integrate with SQL, you know, join the community and write a library. And then of course, if you're responsible for some distributed processing backend, you know, write a runner and join Apex, Flink, Spark, GearPump, Google's, Dataflow, a bunch of other systems we're trying to integrate with. And this enables all of these different runners, all these different uh, users who are writing Beam pipelines to integrate seamlessly with you without you doing any more work on the programming language API. So it really lowers the barrier, barrier <clears throat> the adoption barrier for you know, new languages, new DSLs, new APIs, and new runners. Uh, one thing we won't talk about at all is that uh, there's a really cool project called Chio from Spotify where they have a Scala DSL that's much less uh, Java verbose that lets you write Beam programs and then actually integrates with you know, things like Apache Zeppelin that manage your ops and sort of have one-click deploy and things like that. Uh, there's some great slides on the internet about that. Um, so really sort of a lot of stuff that's going on and lots of different ways for you to get involved. So that concludes my talk. Thanks for coming. We have two minutes for questions maybe, and I'll be out in the hall. 
after and during the break. Stick around for Slava's talk next to learn more about watermarks and triggering. And thanks. Uh, it tend, so how easy it is to convert these things to work on Beam depends on the APIs. I don't have strong answers. My answer is there's some work there. Okay, so for now I just have um, coded myself. Hand coded or build the adapter yourself, so, yep. So right now, the only runner that supports auto-scaling is Google's Dataflow runner. We are, again, you know, the APIs are there for all runners to use, and we're trying to figure out how to best implement them. You know, that kind of integration would probably take integration not only between, say, Flink or Spark or Apex, but also with Yarn or Mesos or whatever container systems underneath the hood. And uh, we're interested in that. We haven't done it yet. Uh, I know there have been threads on the main list about uh, integration with NiFi, but I don't know exactly what the state of that is. Happy to talk more offline with more context. Can you repeat that? So right now, Spark uh, is still, the Spark runner for Beam is still making the static decisions based on you know, number of mappers or number of workers or whatever the right parameter is. Uh, again, we're hoping to get these dynamic adaptations into all the runners. We haven't done so yet.